Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show with your host, Phil Tarrant. Okay, everyone, it's uh, Phil Tarrant here. Thanks for joining us on the Smart Property Investment Show. Uh, in the studio today, I have Matt Abood. Matt Abood, you might know the name. Uh, Matt is a, uh, a former Olympian. Uh, he was out at Rio. He's a freestyler. 50 meter, 100 meters, I believe, and uh, also uh, he's pretty capable in the pool. I've asked him to come to the studio. Uh, Matt's made the transition from uh, being an elite athlete, uh, a swimmer, into uh, someone with a, a day job now. Uh, that doesn't mean going up and down a pool, following a black line, uh, working at the Commonwealth Bank. Uh, he's also an avid property investor. So I've asked him to come in just to share his story of making that transition out of sport into property investment and business but also get an understanding of the way he sees the world in terms of his portfolio and what he intends and plans to do with it. Matt, how are you going? Well, thanks, Phil. Thanks for having me. So talk to me about Rio. Good fun? Good fun. Yeah, yeah. it was awesome. It was the end of my career as, as a swimmer, as a competitive swimmer. I didn't know it at the time, but I had, I had a feeling that that would be the last swim meet that I would go to. And um, yeah, it was an amazing event, you know, to represent your country at any Olympics. Is a, um, for me, it was a, the culmination of a 10 or 15 years as a swimmer so it was fantastic to be there and had a, an amazing time was it always a plan like as a kid growing up like you want to go to the olympics or just evolved into that there was a point in time that the olympics sort of came on to, popped on onto my radar mm. um i grew up in kingscliff in northern new south wales and we were always fortunate enough to have many um, australian representatives there and a lot of them went on to represent australia at the olympics so the olympics for me um was yeah from from a young age was something that i was aspiring to be and had a couple of cracks at it along the way and finally got there and i'm um, at the age of 30. okay that's pretty late right for yeah swimmer. yeah very <laughs> uh i i unfortunately missed the uh, london team by a very narrow margin um but yeah got the opportunity to to have another go in 2016 and and got myself to rio mm. talk me through the the moment of walk, walking out for the um the opening ceremony was that like a shit this is actually pretty cool yeah well yeah. it would have been we did as a swimmer you don't generally get to go to the opening yeah. ceremonies um because we kick off the next day and we had quite a strange uh competition schedule in rio as the times were aligned for um the east coast us tv audience so we were starting um at about 11 o'clock in the day for, for our heats that would go through to about 1 p.m and then the finals would kick off from 10 p.m at night and go through to kind of 1 a.m which isn't sort of you don't think that's too late but by the time you add in like the travel to the pool the warm-up the race the warm down and then your protocol afterwards um if you get a drug test you're lucky enough to get a drug test after finals we weren't getting back to the village till like three four in the morning sometimes really? so getting to sleep we're kind of on a nearly a night shift there mm. um the olympics we had all the glass and stuff in our apartments was completely blacked out so we could sleep in and we were getting up at um just before lunch and going to have breakfast and things like that so it was a a really strange experience but um that you know all the swimmers are in the same boat yeah mm. so, so as a swimmer myself and i, I smile saying now I swim from, yeah, from a young age um your 50 meter freestyle time is about sort of five six seconds quicker than mine uh and that's a lot actually over 50 meters but i know what it's like waking up every single morning to swim i know what it's like to go swimming after school uh, being in the pool being in the gym it's pretty heavy going you've obviously embraced that though was that how did you program your mind to be able to constantly do that because it's a very lonely sport as well swimming right because you just got your head to deal with really yeah you're right. in there in the water by yourself i think yeah. towards the end of my career i i sort of cherished that loneliness i guess because mm. we're so today we're so drawn to you know phones and computers and you know no, notifications and all that sort of stuff mm. so to have the ability to jump in the pool for two to three hours and just be zoned out and involved in completely what you're doing without being distracted was quite nice but you're right it can be um it can be quite lonely but when you're i think like anything when you're sort of driven towards a goal that you want to you want to achieve the, all that sort of drops by the wayside and mm. i even think about you know my career in retrospect now and sometimes i think you know how did i do you know that or how did i do those training sessions or those mornings or you know get back in the water and, and chase the the olympics again for four years after i just missed it mm. in 2012 so like i am sort of um 
perplexed sometimes at how i did it but when you're in it and you're chasing it's like nothing else really matters and you have like a goal set in mind and you're going to get there mm. were you able to flick a switch so as soon as you jump in the water and start swimming can you go into a mode where you disassociate yourself what you're doing and just do other things in your mind yeah in training you know sometimes you would turn off mentally on mm. purpose just to refresh and and have a think about other things and mm. then switch back on for if it was the main set or something coming up that was going to be quite hard um quite arduous you, then you had the energy to refocus but mm. in a race sometimes people ask you what what's going through your head when you race and you hope you hope to be as little as possible so yeah. when you're standing on the blocks you're just empty-minded and you're just in a reactionary state ready to start but um yeah, it's a, it, one of the things, one of the biggest things I took out of sport was probably the mental aspect and mm. did a lot of performance psychology and those sorts of things throughout my career and, um, you know, friendship and all those things as well. So it's great to have some achievements on, on the on the board, but the, the skills and, and the friendships and the experiences that you get through sport, are, you, you can't get them anywhere else. It's pretty cool. And, mm. and what, what I hope to potentially extract out of you today, uh, just, just really using our skills in terms of dedication, diligence, goal setting that you had from uh, your sporting career into how you apply those same skills. And in many ways, it's the same into sort of growing a property portfolio because um, winning in swimming and winning in property doesn't happen overnight. It's perpetual, ongoing, you know, grind sometimes. Exactly, yeah. um, it's not always fun. Um, uh, it comes with setbacks. It comes with wins. It comes with losses. Uh, so sort of paint a metaphor between the two um, – you know, good mental resilience is is critical in elite sport as it is in being a property investor. How do you sort of deal with sort of times in your sporting career where you're going, oh, this sucks, or I don't want to do this today, or uh, I'm sick of this, or why am I doing this? Uh, how did you sort of deal with that mentally? How, what what process happened inside your brain? The, it was having, I guess, the the anchor of mm. the the end game in my mind, um, and that was always the long game, and I think that's the right way to approach property investment mm. and that's something that is is hard because like i find myself now that's one of the things that i need to keep um, on top of is my patience so um, i want to go out there and do as well as i can in everything i'm doing and one of those things is, is property investing after i finished swimming I, I sort of had a look at my wife and i's financial position and we'd made certain sacrifices along the way um in chasing this the swimming and the sporting goal um it's not the most lucrative sport but so it was about sort of setting a goal in the future and then working towards that and sort of catching up some time so for the swimming piece you know missing london you know rio was was the goal and i wanted to be an olympian i wanted to represent my country at the olympics so i sort of reset the goalposts and then worked towards that i made some changes along the way so i think if you don't succeed the first time it's about evaluating honestly where you're at and mm. what may or may not have gone wrong sometimes it's purely things out of your control and you might be on the right path you just got to have a break refocus maybe make some small tweaks just to freshen up your mind or your approach but then reset and, and get at it so as you're gearing up for, for Rio, so smack bang in, you know, three, four months out, really heavy training, how many hours a week do you reckon you were dedicating to to your craft and your craft being swimming, whether it's in the pool or in the gym or other stuff? Yeah, it was nearly, I guess, sort of nearly a full 38-hour week in, in training. Um, we do eight to 10 swimming sessions, depending on the week and, and the, the amount of training we needed to get done in the pool that week. There'd be um, three for myself. There was three sessions in the gym as well um, and two Pilates sessions. And then outside of that, you know, appointments with your coach, massage and physio, um, sports psychology, if you're on that week or not. So it was kind of on average two to three sessions a day in and around the swimming piece. And one of the most important things with all of that training is the rest that you're mm. getting. So um, fitting in work and study as well was important, but then having time set aside just to rest and recover because everyone can train as much as they like, but if you're not resting and recovering, um, none of the training can sort of take effect and you will sort of just train yourself into a hole eventually. Mm. Yeah. So many metaphors you can pull out of this in terms of property investment and training, right? Mm. Resting and recovering. You know, a lot of people buy hard and they keep buying and buying and buying. But yeah. if it's a property, is not doing anything sometimes and just resting and recovering and let it sit there and cook and go up in value. Yeah, but a bit of time, anyway, a bit of consolidation. Yeah, we're, we're yeah. getting that in a sec. Yeah. So, um, uh, so 
and we'll shift on to probably a bit in a sec, but I'm really intrigued by uh, this the diligence of, of elite sport into taking that to life after sport. And we've had other guys and girls on um, the Smart Prop Investment Show previously who are in the same boat, ex Olympian or cricketers, all this sort of stuff. And uh, they say a lot of the same things. Um, you know, this this diligence and persistence and doggedness and, and the ability to rationalise stuff going on in your sporting life and using that into the future. So gearing up to, you didn't make London, you, 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 you spent four years preparing for Rio. You're working during that period of time. So you now work at the Commonwealth Bank, but during that period of time, you're also working there where you're getting a craft or a skill behind you for life after sport. Yeah. So um, don't get me wrong. Like I swam pretty well in 2012. Mm-hmm. I did quite fast times. and But again, it was about there was something else there that wasn't quite right. And all I was doing was just swimming. So it was about introducing a little bit of balance into my life and also preparing for the occasion where you know, if swimming didn't work out, like if I got an injury or, um, you know, I just lost interest, then what else would I do? So um, I was lucky enough to have done some work experience at the bank before um, the 2012 Olympic trials. So I went back there with a, a four-year plan and the, the, the biggest piece of that was to get myself to Rio. But um, outside of that, I wanted to develop a career for myself outside of the pool and then do some study in line with that to complement what I was doing. So I went about sort of putting that in place. And that wasn't just like, oh, yeah, I'll just do some work here and there and study. It was literally, they were the end goals. But then it was back to like a weekly timetable. And I had all my training sessions on a spreadsheet. I had the times that I could work, you know, and how that worked, um, where I needed to be at what time each day. And that was how it was for the the following four years. It wasn't concrete. There was times where I traveled and I was away Mm. competing and things. But when I was back in Sydney, uh, training and working and studying, that was that was my weekly f- pattern that I, I sat down with people and worked out, worked mm. on. And I know the Commonwealth Bank is big supporters of the Olympics and, and sport in Australia. Um, so obviously supporting athletes go through the process to achieve excellence uh, in their sporting careers. But the Commonwealth Bank must also see the talent coming out of sports people and how they can be utilised in a, in a work environment. Um, so what sort of work are you doing now for the Commonwealth Bank? Uh, I work in um, uh, our business and private banking Mm. and I do I work in like the corporate finance area a lot of um, analysis performance management sort of stuff so looking over um, you know lots and lots of numbers which which are you a numbers guy Uh, yeah I do like yeah I like to sort of break things down and see what's going on where and Mm. um, so you know when, when I fit that sort of into the property world it's nice to sort of I just like to see how everything's tracking and what what's what's going on with Um, with various bits and pieces so um, I think there's so many comparisons you can draw from business and sport and property investing and you know each it flows each way so I think there's a lot that business can learn from sport and a lot that sport can learn from from business Mm, interesting so obviously you've got a full-time job now the Commonwealth Bank which means that banks are happy to lend you money because you're generating a salary so talk me through um, this step into property investing was this something you thought about before you sort of post Rio that you always want to get into or was it a light bulb moment that said I've got to start creating some wealth here? Yeah I guess the the way I first got into property was I moved to Sydney at the end of 2008 from as I mentioned Kingscliff in northern New South Wales which is a small sort of coastal town and um, I sort of struggled getting used to the Sydney lifestyle like Kingscliff's got like one set of traffic lights mm. you're on the beach in a minute you can park wherever you want um one of the things that sort of irked me when I moved to Sydney was I couldn't really understand the fact that I couldn't park outside my house um, and those sorts of things. So I wanted a place to move back to when I was finished in Sydney. So I just bought a place. I was lucky enough to sort of scrape a deposit together and um, and with the help of my parents at the time, get into a place at Kingscliff. And okay. that was back in 2010. And um, that property, I, I, I sort of look back on it now and I went in qu- without much knowledge at all. But um, I guess for me now, I have a place that if we want to go back to Kingsliff one day, it, it's a nice place and we can, we can do that. And that sat there for you know, six or seven years, not doing much at all. Mm. Um, always rented, which was fantastic. Um, never, n- never a worry, which is, um, which is always good, I think, when you're starting out. But then, yeah, coming back um, after Rio, 
um, sort of evaluated where we were at. I went and met a bunch of people, accountants and financial planners, and mm. just heard their opinions. And um, there was, a, you know, there was the side that sort of liked the managed funds and this sort of insurance and that sort of thing. And I couldn't help but um, wonder where their angle was with that and what the why their allegiances were with certain funds and insurance firms and then um the property side so i started looking at that a a little bit more stumbled across this podcast i went and started meeting a bunch of people and um, one of the things that i had in swimming was a team i had my coach physio sports scientist gym instructor and that support network around myself and that was again sport and business was one of the things that um, was talked about right here so Mm -hmm. i went about sort of creating that team around myself and educating myself as much as I could um, and then sort of setting the things in place to to move to I guess that end goal maybe in 10 or 15 years time I don't know but I kind of like to paddle my own canoe so it was Mm. about getting uh, the steps in place to do that. So you've got a buyer's agent are you using a mortgage broker? Or are you doing it? You're direct through the bank, I imagine. Yeah, that's through handy. the bank. Yeah, the they look after you. Yeah. They give you good rates. Um, well, yeah, <laughs> I think so. No, no, it's like it's yeah. They it's it's not unlike um, it's not unlike. I still use a mortgage broker. It's mm. not unlike. Um, I think you you need to evaluate the whole environment, mm. and even if it's just to put your mind at peace of where you're at. Or I think it's always good to challenge, like honestly, challenge your your own opinions. Yeah. And it's great to act on gut instinct and all that sort of stuff, but making an educated decision and either either verifying that or discrediting it in some way, shape or form, mm. I think is good. And to, you get better at that, I think, the more you talk to people and, and hear their opinions. Yeah, it's important to do so. So you're used to working in an environment where you're leaning on experts to help you excel in whatever you want from it. Again, another sporting analogy, right? You know, you, you spoke about your coach, your training partners, sports psychologists, all these team which are integral to to turn you into an elite athlete and make you excel and exceed at uh, an elite level. So to put in the context of property investment, um, uh, we speak about a lot on the Smart Property Investment Show. It's about having your A-team around you. So those people who know what to do a lot better than you do and I'm a big advocate for myself. You know, mm. I, I don't proclaim to be an expert in property at all, but I am an expert at finding people who are experts. Um, and it sounds like you've got the same mantra, which is good. So so talk me through the, the biggest, um, as you went down this path of... Um, I guess seeing a whole bunch of different people as you bark down the wealth creation path and you see you go and see a financial planner they'll try and put you in the shares or some sort of managed fund or some sort of etf or some sort of tree scheme somewhere and whatever um and i've heard a lot of people go uh, really bad in that regard yeah. uh, depending on who you talk to you get a different opinion so you need to collect the opinion synthesize that information and work out what works for you so you've gone property sounds okay let me explore this um what's the biggest sort of misconception or myth that you think you broke once you started digging down into to this compared to how you used to think anything in particular i can remember with the property at kingscliff um once i i got that and i had it for a few years and um it was on p and i at the time and mm. that's just because that was what i was put on i didn't know any any better mm. um and once you sort of get into that spot where the rent starts taking over and it kind of covers itself i just thought oh this is this is pretty good and then I thought, like, I, you know, I knew there was people out there that own property and they retire on property and things, but I was like, one, one property is not going to do it. But that was about all I sort of thought, thought about. about. I didn't know, you know, how to sort of, you know, refinance and pull equity out of properties and all that sort of stuff. And so, but as far as like myths go, I think that like the, the piece of the trusted advisor is really important. And it's not as, it's not as simple as just going and handing over all responsibility to someone. Mm. It's about nearly making the decision yourself but having those people come in and compliment what you're doing i haven't like i don't think i've debunked any major probably it is like can be quite simple mm. the the property piece it's not supposed to be hard no a lot of people overcomplicate yeah it, you know yeah and and when i was looking myself and the reason why this is probably the reason why i ended up at a buyer's agent i would look a lot myself i'd spend a lot of time looking around different parts of australia and reading different pieces you know in the media on the domains and the real estate.com that i use and blogs and podcasts and things like that and i would get pretty close to finding a place that i thought was good to buy but i didn't have the conviction to act on it mm. and whether that was because just i wasn't 100 percent sure about a couple of other bits and pieces in the area or the property itself or what was you know planned for the future and those sorts of things so that's when i sort of went out and started really seeking some professional 
input around that asset selection piece. I was close in what I was doing and where I was looking, but I wasn't sort of where these guys are at. Yeah. So, yeah. so and you use the guys over at um, the Right Property Group. Yeah, yeah. Agent. So I'm lucky enough to work with, okay. with Big Steve. Yeah, he's, yeah. A, he's a, he knows what he's doing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, if you tune into the show uh, regularly, you know that I also use those guys as my buyer's agent, so they do a good job. Um, how many how many different buyers agents did you see before you chose those guys? Four. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I really wanted to, I really wanted to make sure that I was making a decision that I was comfortable with, mm. and and I I met with Steve probably halfway through, and I I really like we got along well, and I liked the way they set things out and plan things, mm. and obviously you know no pressure environment and all that sort of stuff, but I still went and followed through on the other ones that i wanted to i guess just check in on mm. and um and but yeah ended up d- going with with the guys at right property it's it's interesting that you shopped around i guess like that so so four different buyers agents um by and large were they all good did you think yeah they were yeah. all pretty close yeah. Yeah. um there was one that i looking back um it was it was interesting it was the um, there was like the shiny brochures and mm. there was the chat and it was off the plan stuff. And okay. then, um, and I, I wasn't sort of too aware of what was happening um, early, early on in that meeting. And then about halfway through the meeting, a fellow sort of came in the door. He was the, the big boss. He gave me his business card and shook my hand and said, if there's anything you need, just you know, get in touch with me. And that was when I sort of, I was like, what's going on here? I'll so, ask you off air who that is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so and but that was about making like the 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 best decision possible at that mm. point in time for me. And I think it's important to get if you're starting out on something, it's important to get those very like foundational aspects correct. Yeah. And then you can you've got a good platform to leverage off. It's the same in sport. Like you can you can get lucky sometimes. If you're not doing like the basic things right, your basic sort of fitness basic skills and, and and basic strength stuff mm. or That's, eating the right food yeah 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 at some <laughs> point and you're not getting enough sleep at night at mm. some point in time that'll come back to bite you yeah and what sort of questions did you ask because I, I i get the question a lot of people going how do you work out which buyer's agent is right for you and and you've obviously chosen guys over right property group because they probably suited your style or you know you get on with them mm. or whatever it is but what sort of questions did you ask these guys to work out whether or not they'd be right for you yeah short of asking them where they're buying because yeah. not many of them will sort they're of cagey, yeah, yeah yeah um uh, it was more or less just having um an open and honest chat about where i was and mm. what i wanted to do and then seeing how they responded to that um and the reason i liked um the way that steve responded was they sort of they planned out in pretty realistic terms what it would look like and what we'd need to do um, to get to where we'd want to be. Yeah. And it was just very clear. And I'm like a big fan of being clear and, and having clarity on what you're moving forward on. So that was probably what, um, not to mention just the relationship that was there, but mm. just the, the clarity of the plan and what we're moving towards. Which is obviously something that you had it in your sporting life, right? What, what's my goal? Mm. Go to Rio. What do I want to do at Rio? I want to win, right? Yeah. You know, you, you, um, which is a good goal to have. Um, yeah. So with property now, before and after you had used a buyer's agent or, or even your accountant, do you actually know what you what you wanted to achieve outside of just buying properties? Is that now crystallized? Like what is that goal for you? Yeah, it's just choice. Yeah. Yeah. So I want the choice to be able to continue working or not. Mm. at a period you know not when i'm 65 but uh, maybe in 15 years i don't know but to have that choice i think is is key and i think like if you can choose what you're doing each day you know some of us are lucky enough to own our own businesses Mm. like 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 yourself which is fantastic but you know it's just a a choice thing for me like i wanted to be able to um, build something that would support our lifestyle Mm. um at, at down the track and for me, property was like probably yeah. the 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 thing that I understood that was able to get me there. And you can have a lot of control over it, right? You know, rather than you can stock pick and hopefully uh, some yeah. smart guy in a business does something good to make sure shares go up. But with property, I feel as though you got a lot more control yeah. of your own destiny. It's very tangible. Mm. I like. I'm a fan of property anyway. Of architecture, I, stru- I studied um, drafting for a short period of time. Mm. You know, I love grand designs and all that sort of stuff. So like, that's kind of the. Um, the emotional side of property, I guess, which yeah. is 
it's important to disconnect from that um at a point when you're doing the property investment thing but like i i like the property investment like i like the economics of it the way you know certain areas are growing and different parts of australia are moving and being shaped and where future demand lies in different cities and in regions around the country i think it's pretty interesting mm. and this idea of choice is a goal and i think it's because i see the world the same way right I, I get a choice at a point in time to go you know what i don't want to do what i do anymore i want to slow down I've got a property investment portfolio that will pay me good income, but I don't actually have this number of what I want to retire on. I just yeah. know that it'll sort itself out. Mm. Um, and uh, speak to my accountant, he'll probably say, no, no, you need to know how much money you want to retire on. I don't know. It's probably going to change today what is tomorrow. Have you got this this magical number of what you want to be receiving as a, a income uh, at a point in time when you choose not to work? I did, but it's hard for us because my wife and I have only been earning full-time salaries for like about 18 months okay so it was like a very early stages when mm. um all you know this sort of all started coming together and i don't know like I, I i enjoy um this building phase of buying and researching and, mm. and so you, um, you actually enjoy the process yeah yeah okay. yeah and i like I, I just like i like seeing results in um, you know, on the spreadsheet is nice as well, but just building something that it will be there for a very long time. Mm. So I think it would be cool to get to a point where you could effectively choose what you wanted to do, but keep doing it anyway mm. because you want to, whether that's just little renovations or sub or developments or whatever it is. I think that would be a pretty cool place to yeah. be. So, so outside of the fact that you bought uh, a place up in your hometown quite some time ago, you're relatively new to this property investing yeah. journey? Yeah, we made sort of after that purchase in 2010, mm. we, we made yeah. our subsequent purchase last year. Okay. Yeah, and are you? Um, do you think you're a good property investor or you got a lot to learn? I think I'm good, I understand it, but mm. there's always tons to learn. Yeah. Um, and I think you, you never, like it was the same with, swimming you never you haven't learned everything you Mm. can never learn everything and that's why i'm always really keen to meet people like yourself Mm. and and others that have been in the industry for longer and and that have sort of walked that that path um to learn you know what they're doing why how different if it's different structures or areas or lenders or what phase they're at you know it's always i think it's always good and if i take myself way back to when i was a young kid and i talk about those olympians that were in the pool and i was just like a 10 year old kid looking up to them it's the same thing if you can sort of see what people have done before you and how they're going about it you can learn a lot and you can even benchmark yourself against Mm. those people to to strive to where to get to where they are so Mm. and what's the best bit of advice you've got so far in terms of property investment do you reckon or oh, it's the it would be the patience piece okay. i think yeah. yeah um i think once you sort of start looking for something again and you're in that that phase of maybe making another purchase soon it, it gets quite exciting and you want it to all to happen quite quickly but i just think sort of having your eye on the on the long game and, and being patient with that um good things will happen mm. and just doing things right the first time and the second time and and doing it right as you go taking your time making the right decisions and it's just like if you look at you know it's a different industry but warren buffett he's made like 90 percent of his wealth in the last 10 years or something ridiculous like that so you know that compounding effect it starts to accelerate pretty quickly and um it's just sort of riding out that time and and, and until it starts to take hold yeah and and for you is it like are you going to keep the pedal down you're going to go as hard as you possibly can for this period of time because you know you just listen to podcasts or all the media or whatever they'll tell you that prices are declining in sydney the markets come off all this sort of stuff my, my view is that it's always the invest in the right time and property if you're investing in the right place right so you're still young you're hungry yeah i'm like i want to keep keep going along this path i think and having having the ability to do like other projects down the track like at the moment we're at very basic stages and just starting out but having the ability to build down the track and you know still we need would like to have our own place to live in at one point in time so working towards that um, okay. I think it's important it's cool hey Matt it's a good story thank you you sort of uh, you're on your way now so uh, and and knowing other people who have excelled at um, uh, like high levels of sport um, if you can keep that passion alive mate you'll uh 
make those right educated decisions you got the right mindset as well like actually leaning on people to help you go through this and and uh and make it happen uh, if i was listening to this that's probably the key point i take out of this if you're trying to do this alone um you look at the best performing people doing anything whether it's swimming or sport or business or whatever uh they've shown themselves with quality people and um if you can take that away and uh work out how you can build your own a team to to get you where you need to go um i think that's really good counsel from matt um final question mate what what um what do you need to do to be a better property investor is it just more research and more education or is there anything else yeah i think there's always more mm. research you can do i think it would be good for me to understand um the idiosyncrasies of different cities and areas around the country a little okay. bit better and that's predominantly why I'd, i use a buyer's agent is mm. to is to i sort of outsource that piece of that hard research that takes time um but you know i think the patience is the biggest key for me because i just get a little bit impatient at times and you, you want to start running too early which is good it's good to be ambitious i'm, I'm and sure, all that sort of I'm stuff. sure uh, and I, I know he'll be listening to this i'm sure steve waters hold you back there he's uh yeah he'll be just 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 relax take yeah. it easy you know good things will happen um that's no, good matt uh, well, you give me plenty of headlines as well. well. We'll write up a couple of stories off this as well. This uh, link between uh, sport and uh, and property investment, and I, I think there's there's a lot there. Uh, a lot of it's mindset, right? Hundred mm, um, percent. And, and probably being quite self aware as well. You know, you, you you you're very conscious that you know you got to keep your patience in check to make sure you know you don't you can't always go 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 go. You need to understand yeah. what the end game is and and goal setting and all that sort of stuff. So all really really valid stuff, but. Let's get you back in when uh when you get the next couple of purchases under your belt and you know we'll reflect and see whether or not your mindset's changed. Yeah, that'd where be you good. are today, it's good, mate. Really the appreciate your time. And come back. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for sharing your story, Matt. It's, uh, not a problem. It's really good. Uh, remember to check out smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. If you're not subscribing uh, to our daily morning marketing intelligence, so you're the first to know what's going on in property investment uh, in Australia. Uh, smartpropertyinvestment.com.au forward slash subscribe. If you'd like to get info from social media, just search Smart Property HQ. Uh, any questions um, about this podcast or for Matt, I'm happy to flick them over. I'm sure he'll uh, get back to you. Uh, editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. We'll be back again next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned.